If you've attended this event before, you know, obviously we're drinking water from a fire hose right now, but our next speaker, you know, is the epitome of that. And he is no stranger to this event. Actually, I think, I think I've introduced him every single year he has spoke. Uh, he is an Aggie. Okay, you know, now that we're in person, I expect to hear that. Uh, he has built, he's done a startup company, built it to a $100 million company uh, with over 800 employees. He's been recognized as an Aggie 100 company, and uh, he's writing books now about baseball, coronavirus, refineries. I don't know how all that means. We got to read the book to see. But for most of us that know him, we're also very anxious to hear what his next political endeavor is going to be. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ryan Sitton to, to the stage. Thank you, Steve. run up the stairs, your pants flop over your boot and you look like a moron. It is good to be back in person, isn't it? Goodness gracious, after, after two years, I, I was remembering, how many of you were here the year that we had like the torrential rainstorm, right? And in the middle of my speech, the power went out. That was one of the highlights of my political career, <laughs> yelling across the entire, the speech just got shorter and everyone was great about it. You know, coronavirus has been a really interesting story in modern history, I'd say, of the human race. In fact, I would say that when you fast forward 10 years down the road, it will be interesting to see how history judges the decisions that we made. Do you remember what was going on in your life a year and a half ago when you first got word that, hey, we're going to lock down, kids aren't going to school anymore? Hey, we're, we're not coming back from spring break. Hey, uh, no, you can't come to the office anymore. Do you remember, perhaps, the first time there was an economic challenge that you faced personally? Someone canceling a contract, or are you aware of somebody in your family who lost their job? Someone maybe who owned a restaurant that couldn't serve food anymore. So many things happened over the course of a Gosh, just two or three month period that would have profound impacts on the way our world works. It was so profound to me that as I was sitting now on the, the sort of the outside looking in, what I mean by that was, you know, I had been in the, in the forefront of oil and gas and industry transitions and technology advancements for so long, but to watch this happen and know that it was totally out of our control. Right? Elected officials, policymakers were having to make decisions in weeks, sometimes days, that were going to have, once again, profound impacts on our livelihood. And yet, there was very little we could do about it. Yeah, there were things like, well, maybe, maybe masks at the time. Remember how little we knew. Maybe masks would help. Maybe social distancing would help. Maybe keeping everybody home and working from home would help. I was terrified of this because having to sit in front of a computer for hours at a time, watching a screen and trying to interact, I knew this is going to be miserable. But this is the things that we were doing. And it, this struck me so profoundly that I began to think about how is it that we make decisions? If somebody came to you today and said, hey, Ryan, I got a great investment opportunity for you. You ever had this happen to you? A friend or a family member comes, man, I've got a, I've got a great investment, surefire deal. And you go, yeah, they're always surefire deals. Surefire deal, Ryan. And they say, look, it's a X amount of investment. And so let's suppose somebody came to you today. In fact, imagine this is happening. Someone comes to you and says, I've got a surefire deal, got a great investment opportunity. All you got to do is put in $1,000. And man, we're expecting 30% returns per year for the next five years. You look at that and you say, you know, I, I, I know this person, I trust this person. I may, I may take a chance on this. And for most of us, I mean, not that $1,000 is a small amount of money, but it's probably not going to have a profound impact on our life. So at this point, this is not a crucial decision. Now, let's suppose the same story unfolds, and they say, all you got to put up is $100,000. All of a sudden, it became a lot more important decision, didn't it? That's a lot of money. Maybe it doesn't quite change our lives, but it certainly may change our lifestyle for a little bit of time. And I wonder... What must it have been like to be, say, the governor of the state of Texas or, say, the president 
of the United States when there was no time for legislative action, but you were hearing that coronavirus rates were popping up like crazy. This thing was spreading faster than anything we've seen in modern history. We were hearing that also the hospitalization rates and the fatality rates were larger than anything we'd seen in a long time. Yeah, we'd, we'd had things like SARS and swine flu and things like that, but man, they hadn't transmitted like this. And so you're the president of the United States, or you're the governor of Texas, or even a county commissioner or a county judge, and you're having to make a decision. Do I issue an executive order that may cost some people their livelihood? What must that have been like? I had a chance to talk to an elected official who I know very well was not in one of those executive positions, but I'll, I'll just say it was a U.S. senator in the middle of all this going on. And we got on the phone and, and I asked him, you know, man, I, I, what is this like for you? And he says, Ryan, there's just so much we don't know. And we're all afraid. As an elected official whose job it is to try to, you know, serve the public, how hard it must have been to think about all of the risks, to think about all of the challenges, and to try to make a decision and balance someone's livelihood, someone's business, someone's education, someone's freedom with their safety. Whew. That's a crucial decision. About three, four months after coronavirus had hit us, this is April, May, I had been spending so much time trying to really really, man, dissect what must it be like in talking to people I knew in positions of leadership, not just political, but in business, and asking questions, man, how, what's it like to try to make these decisions? And the same answer over and over, man, we, we just don't know. We are reacting because we're afraid, and the people that we serve are afraid. And so in May of last year, I had, I had spent way too much time thinking about this, and I had been researching it and even looking at coronavirus data. I was one of those guys who was on the CDC website daily, downloading data. I'm not kidding. And they don't have it really easy in spreadsheets. You've got to like download it in PDF form and type it into spreadsheets. I'm running regression algorithms and all sorts of super geeky stuff that my wife still makes fun of me for. And I'm trying to find out, okay, what, what are we seeing? What are we not seeing? And so much so that in May of last year, I was one of the first people I knew to get on a plane, right? So it's still May. Most people are in business lockdown. You can't travel. And I said, I'm getting on a plane. We, we own a place up in Tennessee, up in the Smoky Mountains. I hop on this plane. I fly up to Tennessee. And I sit down. I immerse myself for four days. And I wrote a book. Crucial Decisions. Ryan, you were building up to that, weren't you? Yes, I was. It's a shameless plug. <laughs> I wrote this book, Crucial Decisions. And I share it with you because... It was not something I'd planned on writing. I'd actually written another book, believe it or not, that was finished at the end of 2019, ready to be published, ready to be released in the first quarter of 2020. By the time we got to March of 2020, the publisher said, there's no point in putting a book out, Ryan, because no one's paying attention to books right now. Now, of course, three or four months later, all anybody was doing was reading books. But at that point, we didn't know that. So we said, OK, but you know what? Man, I've got a lot of insight. In fact, in this book, what I write about is how we think about the way we make decisions and what lessons we can learn from the last year and a half. A couple things. In fact, I was just doing an interview with Lee College, and, they, and, and the, the guy was asking me, what, what are you, you going to talk about today? Can you give us some tidbits? And I said, yeah, a couple things. In fact, one he says, what, what are lesson learned, lessons learned, or what are headwinds that are continue to come? We know about the challenges of the last year and a half. What are the headwinds that are going to continue to come? And I'll give you two of them. One technical and one philosophical. Technically speaking, we are going to continue to have economic challenges. Now, if you're out there today as an employee of a company, like, oh, I don't see that because there's plenty of jobs. Yes, there are plenty of jobs. But if you're a business leader or a business owner, your challenge is finding employees. We've had the Great Recession. Did you know in the last 12 months, 58% of the U.S. workforce has changed jobs. That is the largest 12-month turnover of U.S. employees in history by a factor of over two. Literally twi over, more than twice as many people change jobs as a percentage 
in the last 12 months than ever in history. And a lot of us have felt that in our business. We felt that in our company, Pinnacle. Lost literally probably, we, we probably experienced 35, even 40%, all good people. But transitioning, the great resignation as they call it. Now you would think, well, is this just some kind of random thing? No. What's happening is prior to coronavirus hitting, 152 million people in the United States went to work every day. 152 and a half million people went to work every day. After coronavirus, 148 million people go to work every day. Five million people. Well, gosh, Ryan, that's only 3% of the workforce. How big a deal can that be? Well, let's run a little example. Let's suppose I've got 10 companies, okay, that all kind of do the same thing. And in each of those 10 companies, there are 100 employees, all right? So I got 1,000 people working across 10 companies, 100 employees per company. Everyone's doing fine. Now imagine one of those employees over here decides to go to work for another company over there. All of a sudden, this company has 101 employees, this company has 99. What does this company do? They go hire an employee. So they go to the next company, hire one of theirs. What does that company have to do? Go to the next company, hire one of theirs. What does that You can see this thing start to cascade, right? And if everything just works perfectly, 10 people switch companies, everybody still has 100 employees. Now, imagine that instead of those 100 companies, one of those, com one of those employees goes to work for somebody else. Instead of that happening, three of those employees in the whole mix decide to leave the workforce because, man, it's, I'm getting pretty nice stimulus checks and there's the, the unemployment process is pretty comfortable. And frankly, I'm afraid. Who, who can blame them for being afraid? So I leave the workforce. Now, that company has to hire an employee. This company, they start moving people around and there's never going to be enough employees. That's a small, crude example, but that is the reality we face today. At the same time that employees are having record amounts of change, the government is sending out record amounts of individual stimulus. Now you may say, this sounds awful political. It's not, these are facts. Those two things are competing and they are causing an economic in incongruity. And those are one of the challenges that we're gonna face for a while. There's another challenge we face in terms of in economic incongruity. Look at supply and demand of products. Anybody out there building a house or trying to build a shop or build anything? How many of you can't get doors or windows or HVAC vents or electric boxes? There's a shortage of supply. Why? Because for a year and a half, some of those facilities were shut down. Some of those facilities had to scale down, not because of coronavirus, because there was enough demand. Now the world says, well, we want to build at a normal rate, plus we want to build all the stuff we didn't build for a year and a half. Not enough supply. How many of you have, have, have seen in the last couple of years the price of housing somehow went up by 30%? And you're wondering, what the heck is driving this? There is supply, demand, incongruity. There's only, why do I share that with you? These incongruities are going to continue to mean economic challenges. There's no, there's no two ways about it that they're gonna present headwinds to us in a number of different ways, whether it's finding employees, it's buying products, shipping products, doing contracts with customers, whatever it is, those will be challenges. That's the technical challenge. What's the philosophical challenge? And this is one that I will share with you as, a, as business leaders, as community leaders, we have to be aware of even though it can be hard to talk about. The fact is in the last year and a half, Let's just talk about the United States. The way we as a society react to fear has changed dramatically. I'll use an example. If I said, here I am, a 46-year-old man, and I said, what are my odds if I, get, before getting vaccinated, what are my odds that if I got coronavirus, I was gonna die? These are great odds. We've got lots of numbers on this. I can give you very specific data. What are the odds? Ryan Sitton, 46-year-old man, would die if I got coronavirus. I'll tell you, it's about one in 40,000. That's the data on the likelihood of me dying from, if I got it. Did you know that coronavirus aside, there is a one in 2,000 chance that I die in an accident every year. That is US statistics. One in 2,000 people every year die in an accident. It's actually even more frequent than that. In fact, somebody like me, who likes to mountain bike, snow ski, who likes to get out, probably drive my car just a tad too fast, my odds are even higher. Maybe as, maybe as frequent as one in 1,500. One in 1,500 chance I die in an accident every year. One in 40,000 plus that I would die of coronavirus. 
Yet, what did the senator tell me? Ryan, we just don't know. Well, we did know, actually. Data started coming in very quickly, but our ability to process that data and make crucial decisions as a society was not where it needed to be. And so we had no choice. Let me say it that way. We had no choice but to react, to try to be cautious. The lessons that we had learned, there are a lot of books coming out now. Michael Lewis, one of my favorite authors, wrote the book Moneyball, the book um, The Big Short. Michael Lewis does a book about about the coronavirus reaction. It talks about the lessons from the 1919 influenza pandemic. I will admit I haven't read the book, but it's, I will read it soon. I will say this, though. The fact is that if we're looking for lessons from 100 years ago, clearly we're missing something. How do we make decisions today better ways than we made decisions 100 years ago? So as I'm thinking about all this, we say, well, OK, how does this affect what we're doing today? Ryan, we've got a society that's reacting very differently to fear today. In fact, society today that the message is, if you're afraid, just stay home. If you're afraid, just lock down. If you're afraid, don't engage. And I get, once again, I've had friends who have gotten coronavirus and who were on death's door, and it was terrifying. Terrifying to their family, terrifying to my family. My son got coronavirus, locked him in his room for two weeks. Now, we weren't scared at his age. The odds are almost infinitesimally small. But still, it's terrifying. How do we as a society and as leaders in our communities, in our businesses, overcome that? At the same time recognizing we've got all these economic challenges that are coming our way due to supply demand imbalances, employment imbalances. Man, Ryan, you are not making me feel very good at this conference today. Well, there's good news. The good news is that there are tools to think differently about how we make decisions today. Tools that that we have to go find in places we are not used to looking. But if using those tools, the opportunities for those who use them are equally profound to the challenges for those who don't. Well, Ryan, what are these tools? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and we'll talk about how to apply those to our life. Anyone seen the movie Moneyball, Brad Pitt, or read the book, Michael Lewis's book? All right, I'm getting about half the audience. Um, the story of the book, and I'm not going to, if you have not seen the movie, you should watch the movie. If you haven't read the book, I recommend watching the book, but the movie's a great movie. Um, did I say all that right? Read the book, watch the movie. Anyway, you got it. It's a great movie. It's a great story, and it's true. These are the facts. In 2002, the then general manager of the Oakland Athletics was a guy named Billy Bean, and Billy Bean is faced with a pretty big challenge. In the draft a couple of years prior, Billy had been lucky to get, a, get three big-time players, but they didn't know at the time in the draft. Sometimes when they're drafting MLB players, you just sort of take a flyer, right? These guys turned out to be rock stars. Well, the same year, end of 2001, these three players go into free agency. And Billy Bean knows, I can't keep them. Why? Because I, I don't have Yankee money, he would say in the book and say in the movie. I don't have Yankee money. So Bean's got this challenge. He goes to the owner and says, man, I need more money to put into this team. And the owner tells him, nah, we ain't got no more money. Well, what does Billy Bean do? As the movie ensues, Billy Bean goes out and recruits, and this is the true story. These are the facts. Billy goes out and recruits a bunch of players that nobody else wanted, or at least not at near the price tags of the players that he'd lost. And Billy does something at the time that was revolutionary. Billy says, I'm going to recruit a bunch of players even though my scouts tell me these players, ugh, they've got a weird swing or they've got a weird throwing motion, even though my scouts tell me that the data says these guys will be rock star players. So Bean goes on, recruits a bunch of misfit players, gets this team organized, goes out on the field, and that season, the Oakland Athletics would set the record for the longest winning streak in American League history. Now, if you fast forward, the, or you rewind, before they went on that winning streak, there were people in baseball calling Billy Bean a heretic. This guy's insane, they said. He is ruining the sport of baseball. You can't build a team based on data. These are the newscasters and the sportscasters reviewing Bean's performance. Of course, they all changed their tune when they went on this long winning streak. In fact, three or four years later, every team in baseball was copying the Billy Bean method. If you go forward, a, an interesting end of that story that we wouldn't learn for their 15 years. In 2014, Sports Illustrated did a story about our hometown team, the Astros. Anyone see the cover of Sports Illustrated that mentioned the Astros in 2014? 
I see a hand over there. Do you know what? The, this is 2014. Came out 2013. Astros were the last team in baseball. Literally the worst team in baseball. What did everybody here call them? The last rows, right? 2014, Sports Illustrated author writes a bold story on the cover of Sports Illustrated. 2014, he says, introducing your 2017 World Series champs. That's a bold move for a writer to predict three years in advance that the Astros were going to win the World Series. And of course, they would. That guy, Ben Reeder, goes on to write a book called Astro Ball, in which he tells how the Astros took what Billy Bean had done and put it on steroids. The, the whole sport of baseball has changed, has evolved. So we can look at places like that. What did Billy Bean see that all these other clubs weren't seeing? In that 2002 season, Billy Bean's entire payroll was less than the top two players on the Yankees. The Yankees had unlimited money. What did Billy Bean see that the Yankees didn't see? Billy was able to make decisions that others weren't able to make because they had a different process. One more example. Ways we think about data, think about process. A lot of us in the audience today, we work around petrochemical facilities every day, refineries, chemical plants, uh, maybe even large offshore oil installations, all of which are big, complex facilities. Interesting tidbit about the U.S. refining industry. And for those who have seen me in the past, oh, finally, we're going to get some energy data. Thank God. Interesting about the U.S. oil industry, and yes, particularly refineries. If you go back over the last 50 years, from 1980 until 2020, and that, that five-decade that five year that five decade period from the begin from the end of 2018 to 20, sorry, 20, say this right in a minute, 1980 to 1990 to 2020, 2000 to 2010 to 2020. The average reliability, reliability, the average reliability of a U.S. refinery skyrocketed. At the, in 1980, there were 300 refineries in the United States, and those 300 refineries averaged 74% what we call availability, which means those plants could run, on average, 74% of the time that we wanted them to run, or 74% of their maximum in 1980. 300 plants, 74% availability. Fast forward to 2010, 30 years later. Those average plants had, in, had gone from 74% to 91%. From 300 refineries down to 150, but the average availability, the amount of time they ran, from 74% to 91% by 2010. Massive improvements. And now, I was in those plants in, that, in the last decade there. Started my career in 1998. So I spent 10 years in refineries, in chemical plants, doing maintenance reliability work. And one thing sort of summarized the way we did that work. We would go and find that piece of equipment that was uniquely problemed, and we'd figure out ways to make it better. And once we made that one better, we'd go find the next piece of equipment that was uniquely problemed or challenged, make it better, then find the next one, make it better. And that is, for the most part, over a 30-year span, how the U.S. refining industry became the most reliable refineries on the planet by a healthy margin. You go around the world today and you say, you know, the U.S. refining industry makes money. These are profitable ventures. Go just south of us in Mexico where they've got five refineries. Those plants lose money hand over fist. It's a jobs program. The government has to pump money in just to keep them running all the time. My friends who work in the refining industry are laughing, like, yeah, we're crushing those guys. Go over to Europe, similar things. Yeah, they're not quite as much a jobs program as the Mexican operations are, but they do not make money like ours do. They do not run with the availability, the efficiency that the U.S. refining industry does. All capitalized on because we have these incremental improvements. Well, the end of the story is, from 2010 to 2020, Ryan, how about that last decade, huh? I mean, we went, what, 16 17% in the first three decades? How about the last decade? The last decade, the average refinery availability has only gone up 1.5% in 10 years. Did we just get to the point that it's the best it can be? No. See, those years, those decades, we spent finding those individual problems, waiting for something to break. It broke again. It broke. Okay, we can fix this and make it better. Then do the next thing. Fix it, make it better. Imagine your car. Man, first it's the steering pump. Then it's the timing belt. Then it's a spark plug. Then it's the rear differential. And if you kept replacing over, it over years, that car would become really reliable. The challenge is, what if it's not one thing anymore? What if it's not one problem in that plant? 
So when you have heard, I, I haven't seen the early speeches today, but when you hear large industrial leaders, companies like Exxon, companies like Shell, companies like Chevron announcing literally hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars in digital transformation. And you go, what the heck are those guys talking about? Digital transformation. This is oil. Black stuff in the end, gold stuff out the back. What's the digital? The fact is, making these improvements, realizing that to get that next percent availability, to go from 91 to 92, or 92 to 93, or 93 to 94, we can't do it the old way. We can't do it by just going out and finding that thing, having an expert come in and fix it better. We've got to look at these complex systems in ways we've never done before. We've got to be able to pull massive amounts of data together in very sophisticated models and almost real time. Imagine this, a piece of equipment breaks in a plant today and a whole series of things is going on. That plant manager is tasked within a couple of hours to make a decision about how to change that plant's performance. If you asked 30 years ago, we don't, there's no way we have enough time. I gotta get people gathering data and files and experts and briefcases and PowerPoint presentations. This is gonna take days. Now they say, we've got minutes, but we've got the systems to do it. Unfortunately, we didn't have those systems for coronavirus. No one had designed a complex system to measure all the different things going on around the world. Transmission rates, uh, in, uh, hospitalization rates, actual fatality rates, what treatments were working, which ones were not. A lot of that communication was happening old school. The one guy in the one county that had seen a treatment work talking to somebody at the CDC, old school communication going around. Hence, our reaction times were slow. Senators are saying things like, we just don't know, and we have to react out of fear. So the challenge to us now as community leaders, what do we do differently? How do we shift our decision process? If we buy into this stuff that this Ryan guy is talking about, and we say, we're gonna change the way we run our businesses, run our communities, run our organizations. How do we change? Well, the first thing is being willing to change at a pace we've never had to change before. Recognizing that with technology, with challenging market environments, let's even face it, in the oil and gas industry specifically, as we look at things like, man, ESG pressure from governments all around the world. I read an article yesterday, quick sidebar, I read an article yesterday from an Australian university that said the largest amount of CO2 being pumped into the atmosphere today is not coming from petroleum, fossil fuels, it's coming from decaying wood. Interesting study that was done that decaying wood, trees that have fallen down around the planet is pushing out more CO2 than all fossil, fuel, all fossil fuels combined. Yet still, no one's blaming the trees, right? These are the practical pressures that we face. Recognizing all this changing landscape, government regulation, people subsidizing all other competitive things, other competitive energy sources, all these are the, the, the challenges we face. So how do we react to this? I wanna share with you, a different process. If today I said, okay, we got a crucial decision to make. Let's go back to a $100,000 example. Someone said, all right, Bob, $100,000 opportunity. You go, man, that's a lot of money. But if you're right, I can get 25% return. That might be worth looking at. How do I make that decision? Typically, what we do is we gather all the information we can, sit down with a group of as many trusted advisors as we can. We cuss and discuss and we argue. We come up with all the possible options, all the possible outcomes, try to describe the risk. And at the end, someone makes a call. And there are varying degrees of that process, but usually that's it. What if instead there's a different process? I don't care whether you're a small business, you run an economic development organization, you run a chamber of commerce, you run a large corporation, you're the president of the United States, or you're just some data geek hoping to get his PhD in data science. What, you, what if there's a different process in which we no longer say, hey, I've got this singular choice or I've got this range of decisions, I'm gonna get a bunch of experts together. Instead, let's frame up the situation and the possible outcomes with a bunch of data. Oh, Jiminy Christmas, I, I skipped to statistics in college. Why are you gonna cover this stuff? <laughs> the world today is, is awash with data. Literally, these, you hear about data centers being built all over the world just to house data. Trillions, trillions of, data by, of, giga, trillions of gigabytes of data are being processed every day. 
Can we in our businesses do two things? One, frame up the situation, frame up the opportunity, frame up the change, the landscape that is coming at us, the changes in our society, the changes in our plants. Can we frame those up with a set of data, a set of constraints, and then can we pull that information together efficiently and, go with me for a second, mathematically. I know some of us in the audience, Ryan, I don't, I'm not the spreadsheet dude. Well, luckily for you, somebody around your organization is. Well, Ryan, I'm not the algorithm guy. I'm not the regression analysis person. I'm not the gal that likes to sit there and reverse engineer a mathematic equation. You've got to be kidding me. That's okay. Somebody in your organization is. Our job as leaders is to not, is to not go, oh my gosh, I don't really get that digital transformation, artificial intelligence, machine learning crap stuff. <laughs> Our job is to say, how do I bring that into a decision process in a way I've never used it before? I will tell you, as per somebody who's doing this in our business right now, this is not a choice that we are going to make. It's an objective we have to pursue. People are going to choose to make decisions more quantitatively. People are going to choose to bring in better methods and better systems for understanding what we know and understanding what we don't know. People are going to strive to replace fear with logic. We're going to strive to replace qualitative analysis with quantitative. And we're going to strive to make better decisions. If you're asking yourself today, Ryan, that sounds great. How do I make that transition? How do I go from the way we've always done it, literally for decades, to a new model of doing it? There's actually some fairly easy steps. To, and actually, I talk about that in the book, Crucial Decisions. Um, it, I outline a 10-step process, and you can find them a lot of places. A way to go from a, a qualitative or a subjective decision process to a complex quantitative process. And what you'll find is it's easier than you think. It's not just bringing together the experts. It's bringing together different skill sets than we've had before. How will this affect us? And I'm going to close on this and take questions. How am I on time? I'll have about 10 minutes of questions? All right. I'll close with this. I described the, the challenges we faced in coronavirus. I described a couple, of, a couple of industries, baseball and refining, where they're having to transform the way they do business to be competitive. And I've talked about different decision processes that we can use. I don't care if you're you know, Exxon or the US government or you're running a little staffing agency in Pasadena, Texas. Different ways to make decisions to not only go past or get through the challenges, but to take advantage of opportunities that are out there. And I'll close with one last, one last story. If you ask the question, Ryan, you know, how much money does the world donate in charitable giving? I explore this case study in the book, Crucial Decision. How much does the world give in charitable giving? The world gives on average, in fact, just the United States gives on average something like $70 billion a year. Massive amounts of money go to charitable giving. There's a company called GiveWell. You look them up online, it's an interesting company. GiveWell's charitable output, charitable initiative, is to gauge the value of charitable giving. GiveWell assessed about three years ago all of the charitable giving, and, and not, they didn't do 70 billion, they only assessed about a billion. People went to them and said, would you assess our agency? Said, and GiveWell found that across that billion dollars, less than 90% of it actually produced value. In other words, GiveWell found that of that billion dollars they evaluated, 90% of it could have been not given at all and would have resulted in zero change to the communities in which they were donating the money. And you go, well, how in the world can that be? Well, think about the way we give money today. Probably everybody in here gives to some you give to your church, you give to United Way, you give to your company, you know, community organization somehow. Do you really go through a process to assess what is that, that group I'm giving to? What are their objectives? What are they going to do with the money? How are they going to actually transform someone's life with it? We don't typically do that. We typically, I'm guilty of this. I give to an organization because I've got an emotional attachment to their message. I'm telling on myself. That is not a crucial decision. There are examples like that all around us, where we, yet there are some charities that have really great data on how a dollar translates into, somebody, into somebody's life changing. One story that was covered in the New York Times, and I'm gonna wrap up. New York Times covered a charity that was training seeing eye dogs. On average, it costs $42,000 to train a seeing eye dog. All right? Now, if you're a blind person and you got given a seeing eye dog, wouldn't, I mean, 
What an amazing gift to give. And if I came to you and asked you, would you all put in $100 so together we can train a seeing eye to go, man, that's amazing. Right now, in countries in Africa, there's a bacteria that infects the eye. There is a surgery that for $25, you can repair the eyes and they will see again, $25. The surgeries are 80% effective. So do the math. $42,000 can buy a seeing eye dog, or we, if we really prioritize helping people see, we can go to Africa and help something like 1,000 people get sight. And these kind of things are going on all the time. And our opportunity as leaders is to affect how we make those decisions, affect what we do with our resources, affect how our teams work together, and affect where our teams will go in the future. Those are the decisions leaders make every day. And those are crucial decisions. I'm going to stop there. I will say this. I'm gonna, I think I've got a few minutes to take some questions. I'll, I'll, oh, man, they're already popping up. Um, before I forget, if we brought copies. They asked me to bring copies of Crucial Decisions. It's on Amazon. If you go buy it, I think it's $19 on Amazon. Shameless promotion. Over at the Lee College table, we captured that. I'm sorry, Lee College people. There's books sitting out over there. I think we're selling them for $15. So if you want one, go buy it, grab one. Um, but like I said, they're on Amazon, so, so feel free. Let me take a couple of questions. They're online. If you've got more, throw them out. If I miss some of them, I will try to come back and answer them later, shoot an email or something like that. So the first question I've got here from 20 minutes ago, what does the data say? Will the Aggies beat Arkansas on Saturday? <laughs> Interestingly enough. Are we, are we live streaming this? Yes. I love my Aggies. I believe they're going to win on Saturday. I will say this, interestingly enough, there, I just saw a, a, ESPN is doing more data analytics on this. They ran a very interesting thing about the competition between the Arkansas running game and the physical game and the Aggie defense, and literally, it's a, it's a pick'em. Like, their data says that it's a, it's a pick'em game, even though the Aggies are much higher ranked. So, all right, what skills and experience are you looking for when hiring new engineers for your company? I'm going to blow your mind. Right now, we are going less and less toward hiring engineers. Wait, what? You don't like engineers? Ryan, you are an engineer. I know. I'm not saying we don't like engineers, but we have determined through a lot of analysis, through a lot of learnings, that having an engineering degree is a data point, but it's not the best data point. In fact, I will share a little, a little insight. This last year, this last summer, end of the summer, we hired five kids straight out of high school. At the local, local Pasadena School, um, they came and met with us. We met with their team, and we talked about the fact that, man, we think that we are paying for a lot of education out of college that, frankly, we don't need. What if we hire, are there kids that you know are not planning to go to college but are great, hardworking kids who are learners? We hired five of them in a, in a pilot program, and we're going to train them ourselves. Our, we believe, I'll make a bold prediction, we believe in five years the kid who comes to work for us out of high school will be making more than we hire the kid out of college with an engineering degree making. We'll see if that works, but that's our, that's our challenge. So, but to answer the question, what skills are you looking for when hiring new people? Let me ask that. Absolutely looking for hard workers. As important, we are looking for learners. I said in the beginning, the world is changing faster today than it ever has. Right now, I got my undergrad degree from the finest academic institution on the planet. I'm getting my PhD right now from the University of Tennessee in data science. And people tease me all the time, what are you doing going back to college at the age of 46? Man, we got to learn. And it's hard. I got these kids in my classes, they're like 26. I'm the like creepy old man that doesn't know how to do this stuff. <laughs> it's humbling and it's challenging, but I'm learning. I'm learning at a faster pace than I have in a long time. And we are looking for people that think like that, that approach life like when you get out of school, you're not done learning, you're just getting started. How do you explain to someone that anti-fossil anti fuel, that high gas prices at the pump is supply and demand, not because big oil is profiting off the pandemic? I'll be candid, you can't. They won't buy it. And, and I say this because I may have to end on this question, but it's a great one to end on. If I'm talking to somebody who is anti-oil and gas, literally there is nothing I can say that will change their mind. It's like believing in, it's, it's, like, it's like talking to an atheist. Or for an atheist, it's like talking to a Christian, right? You're never going to convince each other. It's a waste of time. And I say that. The Christians in the room are going, oh, my gosh, Ryan, you totally don't get what we're trying to do here. I do. <laughs> I'm a Christian. I get it. I'm just saying you've been in those conversations where it's like, man, neither of us hear a word the other guy is saying. Well, the anti-oil and gas people are that way, too. It's a belief. It's, almost, it's like a religion for some of these people. But you can say this. 
Here's what to say. At the other day, supply and demand affects, so you can't you can lead with this. I'll, I'll lean into this question a bit. Supply and demand affects these prices. Oh, no, oil and gas companies are making record profits. I know, they're the largest companies in the world. But did you notice the years where they made no profits? Did you notice in 2020, when ExxonMobil was paying dividends to its shareholders who depend on those dividends to live, despite the fact that they were having to borrow money to do it? You can say that, yeah, there are years where they make record profits. No one is crying in the years when they are losing their shirts. So that's, that's where to start. Second thing I would say is this. For all, well, I don't care what you think about oil and gas, these are some facts. Right now the world uses, call it two-thirds of its energy, comes from oil and gas. The world uses 600 quadrillion BTUs of energy a year, two-thirds of it comes from oil and gas. If you look over the next, say, 20, 30 years, almost every economist says that the amount of energy we get from oil and gas is not going down. It may stay flat. It's not going to grow as quick as renewables, non-traditionals, whatever you want to call them. But it is not dropping dramatically. It's going to stay flat. And if someone said, well, that's a shame. We've got to change that. Well, there are people trying to change that. The thing is, if you want to change that, if you want to say, let's, let's cut the amount of oil and gas we use in this world, say, in half in the next 20 years, you are essentially signing up to have that school teacher, to have that construction worker, to have that nurse grow double the amount that they pay for amount of energy. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to go into communities and tell them we need you to pay twice as much for energy, then yeah, we can pursue that, we can pursue that agenda. But there are too many people out there today that live paycheck to paycheck and for whom roughly 10% of their budget goes to their electricity bills and their gasoline bills. You double those amounts, and by the way, one little tidbit on this, you're penalizing more of those of us who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic bracket Go to, say, downtown San Francisco, right, the capital of anti-oil and gas. The people who walk to work every day is not the construction worker. It costs like $4 million to buy a place in San Francisco. That's the rich elitists. They walk to work and they say, see, I'm so green, I'm walking to work. <laughs> ask that construction worker who's driving an hour and a half into work every day, the amount he's paying for a gallon of gasoline, and ask him, hey, is it okay if we double that so that we can subsidize the rich dude's Tesla? You want to argue oil and gas, don't argue about the merits of oil. If you want to argue with an anti-oil and gas person, don't argue the merits or don't argue the profit structure or the econ economics. Just talk about the facts. We depend so heavily on this energy source that we have to be good at it. In fact, we've got to be exceptional at it. We've got to make sure that we make gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, kerosene, natural gas that feeds our home. We've got to make sure we make those products more efficiently, more safely, and more economically, environmentally than everyone else in the world, because then we can hold our heads high, because they're not going away. And I'll tell you right now, the United States leads the world. And that is something we should all be proud of. Thank you very much for letting me spend time with you today. It's a pleasure to be back at the Industry Forum.